I'm Mark Wilson, the Engineering Heretic. And today we're in, our, in my workshop and I want to talk about lathes, and in particular this lathe here. Uh, when I was setting up my workshop, uh, it's quite a small workshop, it's only 4.2 metres square uh, 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 on its floor, plant, floor, and its floor base. Um, uh, I have a fairly small milling machine, a few other machines, of course a pantograph to my right hand side here. Uh, the reason why, the, there's a couple of advantages with this particular shed over most is well, I've got it lined, um, it's insulated as well. We're in Melbourne, Australia, so it's not a terribly cold climate, but uh, it's not heated. Um, but when I was putting this shed in, I did upgrade the power to the house and consequently I got three-phase power to the premises. And of course, uh, that means that I can buy machines that are industrial quality machines with three-phase power. Um, and of course, this lathe is a three-phase machine, as is most of my equipment in this workshop, which is a bit unusual. Um, quite often, the hobby markets and what have you, um, there are, there are single phase um, with a, of course, a capacitor start motors and things like that, and that's problematic on machine tools. Um, now, the, with, because this workshop is three phase, um, we or I can buy basically industrial machines as long as I can get them into my backyard, which is a little bit of a, a difficult thing. I do have a uh, a, a gantry arrangement, but it's very difficult to get things in my backyard. I don't have vehicle access, so I have to get a thing like this, which weighs about a ton, um, into my backyard by a gantry and lifting up, and it's a, it's a long process. So size and also because it's a hobby workshop, uh, cost. Because I, I don't make money at this workshop, I do this for fun, um, but my fun it comes, it comes at a price. So let's talk about this machine and what's good about it, what's bad about it, um, and a little bit of the history here. The machine itself is called, the, let's uh, move this out of the way here, it's a... The machine itself is a, a CHC by a company called ZNM, which is a... Uh, Eastern Bloc country at the time uh, um, uh, from Bulgaria. Uh, it, uh, it was built in 1979 um, and uh, exported to Australia at a, at a rather um, interesting time in Australia's history as far as machine tools are concerned. And one of the giveaways about the history of this is the fact that it was distributed by Scruttons, which was a uh, one of the sort of pioneer, cheaper version, Taiwanese, if you like, Eastern Bloc uh, uh, com companies that, uh, that co countries that supplied Australia uh, around about the same time as, say, the Lada car and things like that. So things were sort of opening up. And post-1975, when the Whitlam government was in power, a more socialist government, uh, we dropped the tariffs, or substantially dropped the tariffs to uh, Australian imports, and in particular the tariffs on machine tools. So prior to this, prior to nine of the, the mid-1970s, um, all these machines would have made in probably um, either America or, or Western Europe. Uh, brought into the country, we made a couple of ways in this country here, uh, none of which are terribly noteworthy in their, in their construction. Uh, um, they, they were generally hopeless, but anyway. So, at around about the, uh, the late 70s, with the dropping of tariffs, we, uh, people could import um, uh, cheaper machines from other parts of the world, and in particular this one here from ZMM. Uh, it would have been brought in with lower tariffs than usual, um, it's um, and, and consequently, we had uh, 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 companies like Scruttons imported Taiwanese and Eastern Bloc machines at a, quite a substantially lower cost than the regular, very high-end um, machines like uh, uh, like a Mazak from Japan or something like that. Uh, they were just fantastically expensive. Um, 
and we couldn't afford some of the um, most small companies couldn't afford those types of machines or the import tariffs to get them in and this here is a classic example of what happened around about that era uh, the the spindle on this machine is a, a din spindle but it's a little bit of a hybrid spindle um, I'll show you the forward your chuck and show you what the difference is. Of course, the spindle nose has that regular little short taper like you would see in a, in, in a DIN spindle. Uh, normally, at around about that era, we saw these cam locks, uh, which is a little chuck would go on the side there. And this one here, there would be normally three on this particular one here. I think that's called a D14. There was also a D16, uh, which was the standard, more um, uh, conventional thing for you know, at about that time. But this one here, because of the the uh, this was a Bulgarian machine, um, it was a, a variation of the cam lock thing. You've got these bolts, uh, four studs, and of course you've got. Uh, the, the, the DIN spindle nose is correct, uh, but instead of the cam locks, you've got uh, these, uh, these sort of studs sticking out there and these uh, nuts that you have to do on from the back. And you poke them through here, there's a little swash plate that rotates here that you can actually poke them through the holes there and do up, the, uh, do up these bolts here from the back there. Um, the reason for that, I believe, was because um, the uh, cam locks uh, system was probably still under patent at that time, and so um, they would have had to pay extra for that. The DIN spindle is a standard, but the cam lock was probably have to pay for a patent on that if they were going to do that. And of course, trying to keep the cost down, uh, ZNM weren't going to do that. We had similar uh, problems in this country with uh, when we made lays, we had one a. Um, uh, I forget what it's called now. Um, there are a couple of ways made, particularly for the uh, the tape and, and college market. Uh, we made ways in this country here. Uh, a lot of those had, uh, instead of they had the DIN spindle there, but they were bolt-on chucks and what have you. And it was only later on when the when the patent expired on the cam lock thing did we actually see that in this country incorporated ways built here. So that's the machine. Um, uh, it's three phase. It's a clutch operated machine. So when you turn this on, it's quite a. It's actually rather than with your gearbox, but anyway, that's that's life. Uh, the clutch does need a little bit of adjusting. Here, yeah, it's a wet clutch inside the gearbox, and when you engage that, there, that will be forward. And of course, you can reverse that by just trying to leave it the other way. understand there's a little bit of a problem with the lay bearing the, the lay shaft bearing to the gearbox I think it's a bush and a friend of mine has a similar lay that he had to convert that over to needle weld the bearings to, to keep it going. Um, I'll just turn that up it's a little bit noisy. So why this machine? Well weight is one of them it's three phase. Oddly enough for 1979 it's actually a metric machine, which is rather handy because uh, I do most of my work in metric anyway. And uh, this particular machine does not have a digital readout, um, so uh, it, uh, it, it it is a metric machine, and that's rather handy for myself. Uh, the other one is purely cost. Uh, this machine, I paid three thousand dollars for it. Uh, it was a mechanic that had this uh, for a while. Uh, it looks like it's been on site. It's got another distributor there, ESP machinery. So it's obviously been back into the into the secondhand machinery market as well. So it's uh, it's been around for a while. Um, the um, uh, uh, the mechanic uh, it had been a, a little bit abused. It's not worn out. The the bearing weight is still fine. It's not very a wide bear or anything like that. Um, but it, it's for a hobby workshop. It's absolutely fine. But uh, it's not worn out, but it had been abused. I think the spindle had been crashed into the tail stock, into the into the top slide. Uh, it had damaged a few things here. I had to do a bit of work to fix this up. The um, the oddly enough, 
the uh, on the tail stock the bore there was in really bad shape and there's no tang slot at the end of the of the of the of the of the ram here so the chucks have been people who have abused this over the years and obviously spun the the, the, the taper in there and stripped out the Morse taper a fair bit so that uh, I got myself a and it's a number three Morse um, I got myself a uh, a uh, a, a reamer for that uh, set this up uh, to the dead center by clocking it up the other way put a center in here and it's not terribly hard that material is reasonably hard it's tough but I got the the rim and rotated this as I fed the, this in and rotated this and uh, managed to ream this out to restore the surface inside there back to near normal so that fixed that um, the uh, original spindle um, uh, the, the original chuck I actually replaced because uh, it was in pretty poor shape I did manage to find a smaller spindle with the replaceable front jaws that you can reverse and also that gives me the ability to put um, to put uh, soft jaws on the machine and make these up very handy for building clocks and things like that holding very small things because most of these chucks don't hold really down to anywhere near two or three millimeters and sometimes I machine that uh, very small diameters on clocks and things like that so I had to replace that spindle there I was able to remachine the uh, the, the adapter plate to, to suit that, so that was uh, a relatively easy thing to do. It's just a Chinese uh, chuck. Uh, like I say, this is a, a, um, a hobby workshop, uh, you know, I think $300 or so for the chuck, uh, not a lot of money. I did actually turn around and spend quite a bit of money on replacing the, the, uh, the tool holder. It's one of those uh, castellation type ones where that if you can see here it's got that sort of system that that was quite expensive that was about five hundred dollars for that it was a little bit too low when i put it straight on the deck so i had to make a space and get that up a little bit to get my tools more within the range of the adjustments here so i put that on uh and fixed up the uh the, the issues with uh, some of the slides here oddly enough the uh, i found out early enough actually that the the nut inside here that for the cross slide was on the verge of being stripped out. That was quite worn. There was an adjuster. I've got it down here. This is the original nut from this. Uh, inside here, the thread is just almost paper thin, so it's so badly worn. Uh, it does have an adjuster screw here, so it's actually two threads and an adjuster screw that you can lock up inside here. And adjust the backlash. Now I found out this was in pretty poor shape and realized it was about ready to strip out and before that actually happened I actually remade that particular component in bronze um, um, but I didn't go down to all the, all the trouble of um, making the adjuster nut on the end there I just made sure when I screw cut the thread it was an internal one it's a two uh, a two mil pitch uh, left hand thread, uh, which is a little bit unusual. I cut this in before this stripped out. I actually cut that thread in this machine and I just replaced that. Now because it's a, I cut it, I made sure it was reasonably tight. So there's very little backlash on this machine, but of course there's no adjustment. So uh, rather than make up that, I may one day turn around and make one with the adjuster nut so you can adjust the backlash out. but. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, there's a few other strange things about this machine. It actually has a, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come in close and explain a little bit more, but the, uh, the, 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 the crank handle here has no calibrations on the handle itself for the carriage. But there's a dial down here that actually you can, it's graduated, so you can, it has a, and it's got a quite a, and it's a round figure thing. It, uh, it uh, goes to 100, not 75. It goes to one turn 80 mil. And it's a gear driven thing through a mechanism here. And of course, you can adjust that to zero this. Um, all in all, for 3,000 bucks for a, for a, uh, uh, a machine like this, uh, 
it'll do a pretty big cut. Uh, I've taken four mil, five mil, six mil cuts with this. It'll, it'll, the chips will fly out of this thing, no problem at all. But really, for the most part, I'm just using it for hobby stuff anyway. Uh, the coolant, uh, the coolant tank and pump were completely seized up. At the moment, I have removed it completely and just put a drain thing down to a bottle at the bottom of the machine, um, so that any coolant that does get on it just goes down and just ends up in in, in a bottle at the bottom. Uh, at the moment, my coolant is just a bottle like that. Uh, I may get around to uh, replacing that and putting in an aftermarket one and having the pump work properly, but uh, normally I'm not doing a lot of work with this anyway, so who knows, it, it may get fixed, it may not, okay. But that's my machine, um, it's um, quite a reasonable machine for what I do. Um, oddly enough, it, one other feature that this does have, it has a very comprehensive screw cutting uh, gearbox. Uh, it does have all its change gears. And the other thing about this machine was that it was complete with all its steady rests and everything complete, which is very unusual for a machine from 1979 because normally these bits are lost, including the, uh, the, uh, the chasing dial and things like that. It's a complete machine, which is very unusual. Uh, I like using this machine, it runs fine. Um, uh, but the gearbox itself actually will do, not only will it do metric and imperial and quite a big range, it will also do uh, the, uh, it will cut worms for um, uh, metric module and diametral pitch uh, gearing. So it's got some change gears to do that. And oddly enough, because I work in clock building and what have you, I actually use or will have need for those particular ones here. And there's some specific gears that you put in there to cut those various pitches because they're not really a, a regular metric pitch or an imperial one. They're a, a derivative of pi, basically, for both of them, metric and imperial. So that's another feature this machine has. It does not have a foot brake, which is a little bit unfortunate, but for 3000 bucks, a three-phase machine in my backyard, uh, 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 something I can live with. And that's my life, and I'm Mark Wilson, and thanks for watching.